Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com and RockAuto.com. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. And thank you, Alec Webb. And here we are for MotorWeek podcast remote style number 229. And delighted to have you with us and with us also on uh, our little Zoom forum today, writer, two-wheeling reporter, Brian Robinson. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, currently in uh, Dick Cheney's undisclosed location right now. <laughs> this little bunker, huh? Uh, Over the Edge reporter, Greg Carlos. Hello from my home. And road test producer who hasn't been doing a lot of road testing lately, that's Kyle Scanlon. Hey, everybody. Glad to be here. Uh, we've got a lot of things to run down today. We're going to talk about a special that if you haven't been to our, our Motor Week YouTube page lately, you might want to take a look at. Uh, we're going to talk about some delays for some electric vehicles, uh, the new Hyundai Sonata Hybrid, and also the new Mercedes-Benz GLA. And we've got a lightning round of viewer question. We'll see if anybody's got any, a thorn in their side about anything. But uh, let's get with it. Um, we did something a little unusual, and it's up on YouTube at the youtube.com slash MotorWeek. Uh, we did it primarily for uh, our region here in Maryland. We call it MotorWeek Goes for a Drive, and uh, what we did was take a, a series of GoPros, uh, Greg Carlos's Ingenuity, and sent him off a little on a little journey just for people that just can't get outside and take a ride or don't want to take a ride because of the stay-at-home orders that we've got not only in Maryland, but many states around the country. So Greg, give us a little background as to what you did and we can talk about it. Which yeah, well, by the way, there's no talking on the show, very little anyway. Yeah, thank God nobody had to suffer through my voice for 24 minutes, of just shouting out things I see. Uh, yeah, so the, uh, the idea came across and at first we weren't really sure what, you know, how to approach it. We weren't sure like if it was something that people would be into, but you know, what else were we doing at the time? <laughs> so, <laughs> no, that's true. Yeah, so it was really just a matter of uh, grabbing a couple of GoPros and some audio equipment and kind of planning out a route. And, um, you know, it wasn't as simple as just slapping them on and driving. No. I mean, there's some thought that goes it. into it. Yeah, there's, uh, you know, not only, it's not so much of driving, which I found out, you know, doing the route is just sitting and waiting for, you know, at stoplights or pedestrians, especially in downtown Annapolis. So like there's probably another half hour show of just waiting to yeah. get onto the road, you know? Um, but our editor did a great job. Roger um, was able to sync it all up and uh, it actually worked out pretty well. And thank God the, the weather stayed nice that whole day. And you went from Annapolis, Maryland through up uh, around historic Annapolis up by the Naval Academy St. John's College, then you headed out and eventually went over the Bay Bridge, and then you stopped at, what is it, Hemingway's Restaurant on the other side of the Bay Bridge? Yep, Hemingway's at Kent Island, it's, uh, which I have actually never been there before. I've been oh. over that bridge a million times, but I've never actually gotten off that first yeah. exit. And um, yeah, you got a nice little view back of the Bay Bridge. Unfortunately, GoPros um, with their focal length don't really see that far, yeah. um, but it was, you know, for me, it was a nice way to get out and drive. And I actually think it came through in the, in the finished product of just, you know, feeling kind of good on a peaceful mm. spring drive. So surprisingly that came through. Yeah, and we got lucky because we've had so much rain here in Maryland. It was probably like the one really clear day in the last couple of weeks. Uh, if you're interested, it's kind of nice, a nice relaxing way to get outside without having to leave your home, put it up on your big screen or whatever. It's called Motor Week Goes for a Drive, and it's up on uh, YouTube slash uh, dot com slash Motor Week. And I don't know if uh, Brian or, or uh, Kyle had any comment on it. Uh, what would you think of it, guys? I mean, was it something that you think people would enjoy? Oh, uh, it turned out um, better than what I thought. Just hearing yeah. the idea of it uh, didn't sound that cool to me, but seeing it all put together, uh, I think they actually did a pretty good job with it, and uh, I enjoyed watching it. How about you, Kyle? Uh, I mean, yeah, I thought it looked really good. I can uh, definitely attest to Greg, since I live right next to Annapolis and I'm driving around Annapolis all the time, that there's a lot of waiting at lights. There's a lot of waiting for pedestrians. 
you know, that sort of thing. So I can understand that there'd be another 20 minutes to 30 minutes of extra footage yeah. outside of what was, you know, put on the program. But like Greg said, Roger did a great job putting it all together and yeah. I'm glad the viewers liked it. If you ever have doubts, folks, about editing and how important editing is in film and television, uh, it's, it's what makes a good show good. I mean, audio is great. Pictures are great, but if you don't put them together in the right order, it's not so great. So we hope you enjoyed it. Let's talk about some of the fallout that we've seen in the last really just week from uh, the COVID-19 virus and everybody being shut down so long. Uh, we're seeing cancellations, particularly in the uh, electric vehicle area. Uh, we've seen um, uh, Tesla, basically, Mr. Musk, just having uh, practically a meltdown in front of uh, financial people and journalists about uh, what's going on there, even though he made money last quarter. Uh, anybody want to just chime in and say, what is going on? I mean, obviously, a lot of companies, the car companies are losing a lot of money, uh, and this is having repercussions. Yeah, I mean, basically, everything just came to a stop. I mean, you, you can't develop, you can't build, you can't, I mean, there's a limit to what you can do on these Zoom meetings, which a lot of the, you know, car manufacturers, all of them, I'm sure are meeting daily, but there's only so much you can do. Yeah, it was definitely coming. I mean, of course, the Hummer was the big one, but GM's not new to delaying stuff. I mean, look at the Corvette and Silverado and just about everything else that comes out gets delayed. Uh, I think the bigger deal was Ford uh, canceling yeah. the Lincoln. Uh, Rivian SUV that was maybe a bigger deal just straight up canceling it uh, but yeah I mean there's probably going to be more stuff to come. Kyle you basically spend most of your life behind cars uh, are, you, are you surprised with anything that's going on I mean I, I mean guess, you know, in one aspect it can be kind of surprising but you, you could see it coming you know people are out there buying cars no one's spending money in those kind of areas so it it seems like the logical thing to do to either push things back or cancel them and wait until things get back to normal and decide like, okay, we can pick up this project again because we have enough money or we have enough manpower. You know, I'm thinking of when I went to the, the Atlas cross sport reveal mm -hmm. down in Knoxville, I believe in Tennessee. And it was, you know, going around that factory and seeing how close all those people have move. to work. The idea of social distancing and any of those, um, big plants, it's just non-existent. So of course they had to shut down and that's going to affect everybody down the line. Chattanooga, and, and you're absolutely right. That's what I meant. It's, it's, you can't imagine. I mean, they're talking now about, you know, opening some plants soon, like within a week or two. And it's hard to imagine on the final assembly where you've got people putting in interiors and everything, mm -hmm. uh, how they could work close together and not uh, infect each other. So. Uh, probably we've, we're going to see a lot more of this. Why don't we talk about a couple of vehicles that we have uh, a little bit more knowledge of, and one of them is the Hyundai Sonata Hybrid. Who would like to start? Two-liter I-4, but with a 39-kilowatt electric motor, uh, 54 MPG highway. It looks pretty interesting. Yeah, I can start off. Uh, it's interesting to me that, uh, you know, Ford has the hybrid now, Camry has a hybrid, so... Yeah. Uh, the most interesting one was the Ford Fusion, which they quit making. So it would have been an interesting segment now with so many of them in there. Uh, I think the Hyundai, they're all specs. If you look at the specs, they're all super similar. Um, the Hyundai gets a little bit better highway miles per gallon. I think by one number, but they're all pretty similar. Um, the Hyundai has a true automatic transmission. Some people may like, some people may not. Other than that, they're all similar. They, they did a, uh, with the solar panel roof, uh, they did a good job of making it something yeah. special, whereas like the Accord and the Camry are just hybrid versions of the Accord and Camry. Yeah, I guess the only thing you can't get, I guess with that solar panel roof, you can't get a, a sunroof, but I, it, it's a very good looking vehicle. I, I actually like the fact that it, they toned it down. It doesn't look quite as aggressive as the standard sedan, but that's could probably just me. But isn't it amazing that you're getting, you can get now like, you know, mid fifties and something that big. I mean, these are big cars. They're what we used to call full size cars as far as the interior. Yeah, especially on the highway and hybrids generally are known for their great fuel or highway fuel economy. Right. I mean, they're 
they're good. Don't get me wrong, but generally you get you see those high numbers. They like the the tout their city numbers because that's yeah. when a hybrid's most efficient. Um, but we're talking mid fifties on the highway, and I mean that's that's huge because myself right now I'm driving our Outlander PHEV, and as much as it saves us in the city on the highway, that's where you really see that fuel tank start to kind of really dip yeah. down a lot faster than you want it to. So it's got a small tank too. Yeah, and I, so I'd imagine having, I think it was like 686 miles of range on a full tank with the Sonata Hybrid. Um, you know, maybe that's like the absolute best case scenario. I'm sure it is. But still, I mean, I'm sure you wouldn't have any trouble going to the high 500s or low 600s. Mm -hmm. Kyle's had, you've been in the, the standard uh, Sonata. Did mm -hmm. you come away feeling, I mean, a lot's been made of it, and we have too at, at Motor Ring. It, it seems to really be a surprising car that they elevated it that far up the ladder, given the fact that sedans have been losing favor. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. And, um, you know, unfortunately, being the last one down the line here, both Brian and Greg kind of touched on all the points that I was going to touch on as well, with it being... Feel free to, to do it again. No. Yeah, you know, the 600-mile the range, the, the solar sunroof, all that kind of stuff is really interesting. I do love the way it looks. Mm -hmm. um, I saw, you know, when it was revealed, they had it in kind of a burnt orange, which seems to be um, a trend lately in a lot of cars. There seems to be a lot more that we've gotten that have been in, you know, some shade of orange and some of them oh. I haven't been a fan of, but honestly on this Sonata, I think it looks pretty good. The car looks sleek, the interior looks really nice and, you know, having that kind of range and being able to comfortably fit four adults in it, I think is really, really good. Oh, I gotta ask everybody, do you think if you had a Sonata that has the self-park system, we see it in the ads and they had the Super Bowl ad, think you'd use it more than once or twice? Oh, yeah. You would. Okay. I would, yeah. Why not? Because <laughs> uh, it, it takes forever and uh, I could park and unpark three times at the same time. <laughs> I'd, I'd be so anxious the whole time. I'm anxious enough, you know trying yeah. to park myself in a, <laughs> in a city setting. I can't imagine just letting a computer do it and then be like, yeah, totally, just park yourself. It'll be fine. Yeah, I don't know. Standing out there and having the car come at you, I just hope it would stop. More uh, important question, Greg. Yeah. Uh, this is for you. Would you let it pull through to the uh, <laughs> cross? <laughs> Greg's got a real problem with people that pull through two spaces to be heading out. You know my stance on that. <laughs> yeah i guess you better not hang around me much much yeah, i was gonna say i just did that when i was at the store before this podcast oh, yeah i do it all the time I mean, it's, there's just no rules that's <laughs> you guys live in, a, in, in anarchy let's move on to uh new mercedes benz the gla it's a really nice looking i mean this is a revamp of the existing model but the GLA 250, two liter I-4 turbo, 221 horsepower, lots of other versions. The GLA 45 with almost 400 horsepower and the GLA 35, 300 horsepower. Brian, is it more than just a little bit of a change? In your I was, I was going to go last on this one, so I didn't steal everything, but I guess. Uh, I well, still half of them. You're good. Uh, <laughs> The, well, yeah, it's a huge deal because the previous GLA wasn't even an SUV. It was mm. the A-Class hatchback from Europe, which we don't, they don't even sell here. They put all-wheel drive on it and called it an SUV. Um, so this one actually looks like it. I wasn't even sure that they would continue the GLA since they just yeah. brought the GLB out, which is uh, super nice and not much bigger. But uh, it's a bigger deal for Europe because they didn't have a, this, an SUV this size over there. Uh, so uh, it's a big deal for them and big deal for everyone. Uh, uh, I think they did a good job with it. I was surprised they put such an emphasis on off-road capability, almost mm -hmm. like a mini Land Rover. Uh, that's, but I'm sure that'll help with sales a little bit. And uh, I'll wrap that up so everyone else has a little something to say. All right. I let, let's Kyle, let Kyle go for me. Everybody says everything. Okay. okay. Um, so one thing I find a little interesting is the, the wing on the 45. I was uh, looking at all of them side by side, and I thought that was that was a styling touch that I don't think needed to be there. Uh, <laughs> throwing it on, it was it's just a little over the top. The fact that it's supposed to be, and you know, it's an SUV, and like Brian said, they're talking about off-road capability. What is a spoiler going to add with any sort of off-road capability? Is you know next to nothing. I can only imagine. 
And to be honest, I'm not a huge fan of the digital gauge cluster. There's so much screen in front of you in all three models. It's just, it seems like a little too much. It's just, just too, a little over the top for me. Is it just that it's too, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Takes your attention away from the road? It's, just, it's distracting. Like it's distracting. It's, even when I'm looking at photos and I'm trying to get, you know, a feel for the rest of the interior and what it might be like as a passenger or, um, you know, the little touch pad that's down by your right hand, all I can focus on is those two gigantic screens. That's, that's what my eye goes to every time I'm looking at the interior of these cars. I mean, we haven't been in it, so I'm just wondering how it's going to handle big people. Uh, I mean, and Greg, you're tall. Is there, sure. is it, yeah, go ahead. I'm sure it'll handle me fine. I'm not that wide, luckily. So, I kind of wanted to speak on the, <clears throat> the GLA 35 because I remember when the 45, the original GLA came out, that was a brutal little beast, man. It was so stiff and just so yeah. loud and gnarly, which is cool. But also when you just want to come into the neighborhood and not wake everybody's dog and you know, not feel every pothole. Uh, you know, I think the 35, that's where that's going to step in. It has a little bit yeah. less horsepower, but still like 300, I think 301. And a um, small vehicle. So. Yeah, so it, it'll go a long way. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm actually a little bit more curious to drive the 35 over the 45. And hopefully once we get back into production, which we hope is soon, we'll have a chance to, to actually put some seat time in it. Thanks, everybody. Um, we're going to move on to – our lightning round, and I'm getting a lot of questions on the internet about this. Here we go. The coronavirus pandemic has sparked home deliveries of new and used cars to rise. Do you think that's going to continue, or is this going to be the new normal? I mean, we already saw an erosion of showroom traffic, but you know, you can get just about anything delivered to your home now, cars and our trucks, you name it. Yeah, I would say it's not exactly new. I mean, uh, yeah. People, some dealers have been delivering for a while, you know, before this started. It's certainly the high-end stuff, Genesis and uh, some of the Mercedes-Benz. You In Lincoln? And then, yeah, Lincoln. So it's just, uh, I think it'll continue, not to this uh, scale for sure, but uh, if it's an, always an option, I'm sure a lot of people w would love that. Would you buy a forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 car without driving it? See, that was my question, whether it's just about the actual delivery of the vehicle or if it's like you know Carvana when you're purchasing it online because you know you can go to the showroom and you know deal with the car salesman and all that kind of stuff and then say yep I drove it I like it I sat in it drop it at my house in three days and well, in then, some states like Maryland I believe you still have to go to the showroom one way or the other so well, I, I know I someone go and have it still Carvana. delivered huh you know, I was gonna say I know someone recently that bought our car through Carvana and had it delivered here and there was even hiccups in the delivery process through them with you know saying oh some paperwork didn't go through it'll be there four days late and then something else didn't go right so it's going to be another four days late so it wasn't the exact seamless process that they say it's going to be but i'd imagine if you go to the dealership you know sit in it drive it talk to the salesperson and then ask to get it delivered that that would be a smoother process than just buying it online anybody else yeah, I mean, I don't think it's going to really disrupt the way things are done going forward. Um, maybe more people will know that you're, they have the ability to have the car delivered to their house. But I think it's going to be business as usual for the most part with in terms of buying cars. Um, I think the bigger idea thing is what I'm falling into now is I'm having all my beer and food delivered to my house. So I don't see how I can go back from that personally. <laughs> <laughs> nice Brian. He's a Zoom master. Yeah, he's a Zoom guy. And he was just saying before we uh, went on, he's a, he needs a delivery. Um, yeah, I've kind of gotten into it too. I mean, we've had a lot of groceries delivered, and uh, we did go into one grocery store, and frankly, it was kind of a, becoming a foreign experience. So, I guess I guess more home deliveries are in everybody's future, including for cars. Now, if you could just get a car delivered with groceries already in it, <laughs> now we're talking. The perfect world. <laughs> Let's um, switch gears and actually switch plugs. Uh, we had a question from Denny. What's being done to our aging electrical infrastructure 
to accommodate the proliferation of plug-in electric vehicles. I mean, assuming that what we're seeing right now with a few of them being canceled is a pause, and, and at some point there will be a, uh, an administration probably that will be pushing electric vehicles again. You know, we've had a test during this pandemic about whether the internet can keep up with everybody doing Zoom meetings like this, and I've certainly had my problems at home. So are we looking at that kind of problem with the electrical you know, infrastructure? Anybody got a thought? I mean, I'm the farthest thing from an electrical engineer, so I kind of have to base all of my opinions off of what experts say. But um, with, between auto experts, which I consider myself and all of us here experts, and uh, electrical engineer, uh, um, actual experts, they're saying it's not going to be as big of a deal as some people who are saying, like, if we, it, it, it will be a deal. You know, it's not going to be an over the night, overnight thing where everybody's driving EVs. It's going to be a gradual uh, incline of, of, of more and more EVs on the road, which will be a, an issue if we do nothing. But I think between automakers uh, coming out with technology on, you know, when cars are charged and how they're charged, and then the actual infrastructure 10 years from now, 15 years from now, when there is a large portion of the society driving electric vehicles, we'll have figured it out by then. Yeah, if it's going to be a problem, it's going to be way down the road, especially, you know, with uh, gas prices being what they are now and yeah. uh, everyone holding off on EVs. Uh, we're not, it may be a problem we have to deal with, but no, uh, no time soon. Kyle, anything? I just have to agree with everything, you know, both Brian and Greg just said that it's, it's, it's not going to be an overnight thing where suddenly so much of the populace is going to be driving EVs that no one's going to be able to plug them in anywhere. And, you know, I'm sure there's going to be way, you know, other than the, what, the low end chargers that people will get at home that they can just plug into their wall or spend a little extra money to get the, the higher level chargers mm -hmm. at their home. I, I don't think it'll be a problem because it's, not enough cars are going to be on the road immediately. You know, I, I've seen so many articles that basically say that even when we get 10, you know, 10, 20 percent of the sales being electric cars, that, you know, most of the charging is still going to be overnight. It's still going to be, you know, eight or 10 hours with a car sitting at home. And that's so really the question is whether or not your home's going to be able to handle it. And if you're asleep, probably, but you start to say something. That's where like the manufacturers kick in and, you know, giving you the technology to choose. You know, you can, your car can be plugged in, but it's not necessarily charging. And right. another thing is going to be a vehicle to grid. So, you know, eventually when there's that many cars being charged, if it's plugged in, it might be a scenario where that car is acting as storage and maybe giving power back to the grid. And then to your next door when, neighbor. Right. And then overnight, when there, the demand's less from people running TVs, computers, whatever, then it'll start charging again. It'll all be software, essentially, telling it when to charge and when to give back. I think that's absolutely correct. I've already, there's some utilities like uh, uh, the uh, one in Chicago that I heard their president speak, and that's exactly what he's looking forward to, is being able to use people's cars as a storage and then giving them a cut on their electric rates. So. Denny, I hope that uh, kind of gives you an idea that we don't think that's a, a super big problem. All right, gentlemen, that brings to a close our podcast 229. Brian Robinson, Greg Carlos, Kyle Scanlon, thank you guys very much for giving us your time. And uh, we hope you out there enjoyed watching our, even on the Zoom and on YouTube and Wherever else you can find Motor Week these days, we're still out there on public television stations around the country and also on the Motor Train Cable Network. Uh, admittedly, at the moment, the shows uh, are repeats of shows we did early in the year, but we hope to be back in production uh, in just a few weeks from now. Fingers crossed. I want to thank our, our audio engineer back at home base at Maryland Public Television, Jim Bigwood, who normally is doing all of the work of making us sound uh, coherent. Uh, Greg Carlos here for setting up the podcast. He's our producer and our podcast creator back at MPT, uh, Bob Mixter. Thank you all for being a part of our podcast and for keeping Motor Week on the front burner when it comes to automotive news. I'm John Davis. We hope to see you and we hope you see us again soon. You've been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. 
Motor Week is made possible by TireRack.com and RockAuto.com. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at MotorWeek.org. And watch Motor Week, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.